Bienvenue à tous et à toutes pour ce débat euh, autour du journalisme participatif, parfois on l'appelle aussi journalisme collaboratif, journalisme citoyen, euh, et ce qui va nous permettre de... C'est une voie à suivre pour euh, réconcilier les publics, c'est un peu la question qui est posée aujourd'hui. Et je me disais, euh, en préparant le débat, je reprenais une phrase d'Honoré de, de Balzac qui disait euh, « si la presse n'existait pas, il ne faudrait pas l'inventer ». Donc ça date du 19e siècle et déjà, euh, à l'époque, euh, il y avait une défiance à l'égard des médias. Et on connaît les critiques qui nous sont régulièrement adressées, qui sont euh, « euh, les médias sont déconnectés du, du réel, les médias sont vendus euh, au grand capital, ils ne sont pas suffisamment indépendants, euh, ils sont trop proches des pouvoirs, etc. » Alors est-ce que euh, cette, ce concept de journalisme participatif ou journalisme collaboratif qui est né au début des années 2000, euh, est-ce que c'est une, une manière de faire du journalisme qui peut nous réconcilier avec les différents publics euh, Alors, quand on a, avant de, de vous présenter les, les, nos trois invités, euh, rappelez que derrière cette idée de journalisme participatif, il y a, il y a, il y a, il y a pas mal de, de définitions possibles. C'est à la fois euh, l'idée que tout citoyen peut... Euh, euh, quel qu'il soit son niveau social, euh, sa position dans la société, être journaliste, producteur de contenu, reporter, euh, c'est un peu l'idée, ne, ne haïssez pas la presse, soyez la presse vous-même. Euh, mais il y a aussi la vision qui est, euh, on aimerait un monde sans journalistes et, et ce serait mieux si les citoyens réalisaient du journalisme eux-mêmes. Alors ça, ça a débouché sur la création de médias qui sont très spécialisés dans, dans ces questions-là, il y en a eu beaucoup en France, euh, partout dans le monde. C'est aussi des pratiques journalistiques de crowdsourcing, par exemple, qui permet d'associer les citoyens à, à la réalisation d'articles. C'est des, des nouvelles formes de gouvernance aussi. Il y a des clubs de lecteurs, la création de médiateurs, d'ombudsman, on en parlera après. Euh, C'est aussi toute l'interaction qui se crée. Donc, ça, regret, ça, ça, ça regroupe, disons, beaucoup de choses derrière cette idée de, de journalisme euh, participatif. Alors, euh, aujourd'hui, pour, euh, pour en parler, on aura... Euh, Quatre expériences, <rire> la mienne comprise. Mais d'abord, bienvenue à, à chacun. Euh, et d'abord à euh, Sofia Dalpama Rodriguez, qui est donc euh, la cofondatrice et rédactrice en chef du média euh, Divergente, qui est journaliste, qui a une longue expérience de reporter euh, partout dans, dans le monde, euh, qui a cofondé donc, ce média qui propose une, une vision euh, à la fois narrative du journalisme. Et je voyais son slogan qui était « Le monde n'est pas noir ou blanc, mais le journalisme que nous faisons ne l'est pas non plus ». Donc c'est l'idée de la nuance dont on parlait tout à l'heure. Et Sophia a réalisé pas mal d'enquêtes et de récits narratifs. Voilà. Alors ensuite, on aura un autre, une autre personnalité qui vient d'Estonie, Tarmou Tamerk, qui a été journaliste et rédacteur en chef, qui est formateur en médias en Estonie, qui a une plus de 15 ans d'expérience dans les journaux, dans la radio et la télévision. Euh, il est aussi l'un des auteurs du Code estonien d'éthique journalistique, donc il a une, une longue expérience. Euh, mais euh, aujourd'hui, il est médiateur à la société publique de radiodiffusion estonienne, donc euh, et il a aussi occupé le poste de président de l'organisation euh, Organization of News Ombudsman, donc il nous parlera euh, de sa vision euh, du journalisme collaboratif en tant qu'ombudsman aussi. Euh, voilà. Alors, euh, le, la, notre troisième invité est Aitor Hernandez Morales, qui est donc euh, le journaliste lui aussi, qui a une, une longue carrière derrière lui, euh, qui a travaillé pour différents médias, El Mundo, El Espagnol, le Courrier International, euh, et qui est l'auteur du Living Cities Global Policy Lab de, de Politico, donc qui est journaliste là-bas et qui pratique, qui a un projet assez innovant de, de journalisme collaboratif, qui étudie euh, la relation entre les Européens et les villes. Euh, dans lesquels, enfin, les, les Européens avec leur ville. Il a notamment travaillé sur les questions d'énergie et de climat en Europe, et donc il nous partagera son expérience. Et moi, enfin, juste, je vous partagerai une, une expérience modeste ici en Belgique euh, de journaliste pendant 18 ans au quotidien le soir, et puis surtout euh, depuis 10 ans au, comme rédacteur en chef du magazine Imagine, qui est un magazine qui s'inscrit dans un, un journalisme lent, un journalisme... Euh, pour le coup d'impact, euh, et qui est aussi a, au cœur de son projet éditorial euh, euh, la question de la collaboration, du, de la participation des publics. Voilà. Alors on va procéder en deux temps, donc euh, chacun de nos invités va, 
va, va vous exposer un petit peu sa vision du journalisme collaboratif euh, et participatif. Et ensuite, on, on échangera évidemment euh, ensemble. Mais Sophia, je vous cède la parole pour votre présentation. Hi, thank you so much. So, I hope uh, we were not. I, I was not invited to talk about citizen journalism because at Divergent we for sure don't do it. What we actually do is to f to find new ways of reconnect reconnecting people, reconnecting our audiences with what we do. Uh, we are a very small team, we are just four people, uh, and uh, we, we are a digital um, uh, magazine of narrative journalism. Uh, we cover mostly uh, human rights uh, and citizenship issues, uh, and we always uh, give a place to sources from underrepresented environments. Uh, that means that the journalist we do uh, is also different from what uh, we can see uh, in the regular agenda setting, because in a moment you have contact with the different people. You also have different subjects, and we also have different uh, features to write about. Um, our challenge, we are a long form, uh, we do long form features, uh, our projects take uh, a lot of time, um, sometimes one, two, three years to be finished. And the main question is how can we explain to our public, to our subscribers, uh, that we only publish one or twice a year. Uh, how, how can we keep contact with them? And um, we send a monthly newsletter uh, that is not uh, um, uh, original. Everybody sends newsletter. What, what we do is we take a lot of care of the, about uh, the writing, about the design and the photos of it. So uh, it's something that uh, uh, it's, um, we can see it was done carefully and people write back to us saying, oh, that was amazing. We always share a kind of a, um, a background experience of our newsroom and we try to connect what we do also with the subjects we, we cover at, the, at that newsletter. And then the two original approaches that we, we have is we organize um, public conversations uh, and public presentations of our features. That means that uh, in theaters, in museums, in universities, uh, we, we invite people who follow us to be there and to talk with us about uh, the subjects and the features you did. And uh, it uh, uh, normally have uh, the same structure. Uh, the, in the first moment, uh, the journal divergence journalists give uh, an overview of the subject and uh, we summarize it. And then we always invite uh, the sources we, we listen to in our features to be there and to speak by themselves. That means that we amplify the voices of people from underrepresented communities also. And in a third moment, so journalists of Divergent, they talk, then we can listen the sources about the subject. And in a third moment, there, there is always a Q&R session where our audience and the public can ask questions to journalists, but also to the people who are there and who we have uh, interviewed before. Um, and uh, to, to finish, uh, um, the, other th the, the other original thing we do to be connected with our audience is we send, we send them handwritten letters. Uh, we had that idea two years ago and it was, well, we don't know if it will work. And it worked. Uh, like people feel special to receive a hand uh, handwritten letter, and we we can build up a different type of connection with our subscribe our subscribers. Uh, I can tell you that uh, more or less 200 uh, people shared their home address with us. 
and every time uh, we publish a new chapter, every time we publish a new feature, we send them a special letter. It can be um, it can be a, a, a postal. It can be something uh, asking them to interact with. It depends on the the subject we are covering. But uh, it's it. Then I will. T I don't want to use a lot of time. So uh, that's the the three main things that we do to be connected with uh, with our audience and to invite them to share. Uh, what is important for them? Because when we do uh, this question, what is important for you? Most of the time, we we have back a great story. Thank you, Sofia. Termo. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, talking of letters, uh, handwritten letters. Um, as ombudsman for the public media company in Estonia, I'm getting sometimes some from the audience, of course. Um, the um, and it's a very special day these days, actually. Uh, you know, uh, there's noise already in the corridor. Oh, there's a letter today. <laughs> you know, it doesn't come very often, once a month or so. But uh, still, uh, sometimes people uh, take the trouble of writing a letter, but in, in most cases, these are people who are not actually connected to the internet. And this is the reason why they do it. So, collaborative journalism and the role of the ombudsman in this is actually, for me, to, to get the audience involved as much as possible in, in the most sensible way. I'm not in charge of any uh, collaborative journalism projects in the newsroom, of course. But uh, as, as the role of the ombudsman uh, in the ideal world is actually to be the eyes and ears of the audience, to listen to them and to, to sort out the most sensible proposals to make the programming on public media better. At the same time, the ombudsman has to defend uh, journalists against unfair attacks, which are based on you know, too general uh, uh, criticism of bias or whatever then I have to do some analysis of my own and defend the journalist. But the, the key thing is to, to get the most sensible ideas on board, which might otherwise get lost, because it's uh, only natural that uh, people get in touch directly with the editors and journalists. But uh, sometimes there are organizations or, or just people also who um, are making uh, proposals about uh, how to make programming better, what new ideas to include. Um, and editors, journalists, have a busy time, most of the time actually, not very good at answering all those proposals and letters. So this is one way how the ombudsman steps in. Uh, by law, I'm obliged to give replies uh, to letters that, uh, that the uh, public media company is getting. So it's another uh, tool to make it clear to the audience that um, if my interaction with the journalists does not work, I can turn to the ombudsman. And this has helped build up trust for public media in Estonia. Uh, in a previous panel here, it was mentioned that um, uh, Swedish radio is very um, uh, highly rated in, in, uh, in the trust index in the country. Public media in Estonia as well. I think uh, um, the best result in the past five years was at the end of last year. 74% of the population says we trust the public media company. So it comes like number five or six institution nationally. I wouldn't like this figure to be higher actually, then you might feel like you're God or something, that everyone believes in, in you. No, 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 that wouldn't be a good idea. But uh, uh, the role of the ombudsman uh, has helped understand people, how journalists work as well, because I'm running a radio show on media ethics. It's an ombudsman program, not a journalistic program. I invite editors-in-chief, reporters who do sharp stories, which cause a lot of controversy, uh, I invite them to the studio and ask them to explain why do they think that the audience reacted in a painful way? Why, why was there some sort of disappointment to the story or some criticism of the story? And then journalists have a, have a place where they can explain things in the framework of media ethics. As I'm in charge of seeing that media ethics is being observed, this way we can do some media literacy as well. And again, this way we engage the audience. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Okay. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so I run a, a project called uh, Living Cities Global Policy Lab at Politico. So for you guys who aren't uh, as familiar with the uh, publication, Politico came to Brussels around 2015. Uh, the focus being very much the Brussels bubble. So our core audience are the EU institutions, and we report on what the Parliament, the uh, Commission, and the Council do. Um, Global Policy Lab started out as a project that sought to break out of that very institutional mold where we're essentially dealing with governments, lobbies, and then the institutions, and instead tar start reaching out much more to the readers, to the general audience, and give them an opportunity to interact with us. Um, so initial versions of this um, format focused on topics dealing generally with health, uh, but a few years ago I proposed uh, branching out the political brand and the political model outside of Brussels and uh, try to reach more local audiences. So how did we do that? We decided to go directly to coverage of cities around Europe. Um, this particular format, which is called Living Cities, was launched in March of this year. And uh, basically we're working with themed chapters. So the first one was about quality of urban life. The second one, which we ran over the summer, was about mobility. And right now we're in the middle of this chapter on energy and climate in cities. So uh, for everything related to this panel, why is this uh, relevant? Because in our coverage, besides the fact that we really are trying to cover issues that are directly relevant to urban audiences, so people living in cities, we also very much want to talk with our audience. So the ways in which we do that aren't as charming as, as uh, what Divergente is doing with the letters, but uh, instead we try to keep in touch with them through email and through Twitter. Uh, so every week we publish a newsletter. In that newsletter, we'll have a question to the audience where they can just email me directly and we can start having a conversation about that issue. So in today's newsletter, which is going to go out in a couple of hours, we ask them, for example, this topic, again, is about energy in cities, right? So uh, on Sunday, there's this uh, city in Spain called Vigo that is this tiny Galician city. It's really not worth visiting. It's very ugly. But uh, what the mayor there has decided to do to put themselves on the map is to become the christmas light capital of the world. And on Sunday, he lit 11 million light bulbs in the city and turned it into this, you know, it's actually painful to walk around the city because it's so bright. Um, because that's the way he wants to stand out. Now, our question to our audience is, in the middle of an energy crisis, in the middle of the war in Ukraine, is this really appropriate? And should we be doing this really in any of our cities? So we hope that uh, people will then respond to us and tell us, well, you know, I think it's a great idea because holiday lights capture the spirit of Christmas. Or alternately, many people will come back and say, this is ridiculous. And also, I don't even want to see Christmas lights in Brussels. We should be saving money. We should send that money, you know, to the Ukrainians. We should try to practice that level of austerity. So that's an example of just how we try to interact with them week by week. But then I, as the lead writer, also try to do this through Twitter. So every week, if we're focusing on a feature story which will focus on an issue in one or several European cities, I will then write about it on Twitter and try to engage with the audience on, uh, on that matter. So reactions to that vary. Sometimes you have a lot of people very passionate about a topic and we will get thousands of responses. So uh, this summer, for example, we wrote one about how cities are becoming these deadly heat traps because of climate change. And we literally had thousands of responses to that on Twitter threads and then many people just writing to me directly to tell me about the problems that they were facing in their cities. Similarly, we ran a story earlier this month about how we all want more trees in cities but mayors are having a lot of trouble uh, planting them. And we explained that part of that is that during the 60s we kind of hollowed out all of our cities. So you have really great examples here in Brussels where nearly every square in Brussels has a parking lot under it. And that means you can no longer put up any trees on it because the structure won't support it. They're too heavy. Most people don't know that. So when we reported on it, the reaction from people was just a combination of both wonder and indignation at you know, how we had essentially ruined our cities during the 60s and how this was really going to be a real mission to come back from. So uh, you know, to, to get back to, to the point, what we try to do is have that conversation going on and foster a spirit where readers know that they can come to us and they can come to us to complain about a story, to share thoughts, and even to suggest stories to us and tell us, you know, we have this 
really fascinating thing going on in Porto, or we have an amazing thing going on in Madrid, or you wouldn't believe what they're doing about energy efficiency in Tallinn, and we'll, we'll go, and we'll check it out, and then we'll write about it. And that, I think, is good generally. It's, it's good journalism because it's, it's really giving the opportunity to shed that light on these different parts of Europe and for our mission to do pan-European uh, journalism, that's great. But I think it's also very good for the political brand, which was starting to become very much this publication basically catering to a very elite group, and it does that very well. But the idea is to branch it out and to get more people to get involved in the journalism that we do. <coughs> Thank you. Um, but just you partage uh, l'expérience donc uh, de, du média pour lequel je, je travaille, uh, qui, qui s'inscrit aussi dans un journalisme collaboratif, uh, qui est donc un média qui existe depuis 25 ans, qui traite des questions uh, d'écologie et, et de société, et qui donc uh, uh, traite aussi des relations nord-sud et s'inscrit dans un journalisme lent, je vous disais, donc uh, qui est un, un bimestriel, uh, qui essaye de pratiquer. Uh, euh, une, un journalisme d'impact qui, qui porte un regard libre, non, prospect, euh, non, non conformiste, prospectif aussi sur les, les, les questions euh, euh, comme la crise climatique, euh, la crise de la démocratie, euh, euh, la montée des inégalités sociales, etc. Et donc, euh, on a développé chez, chez Imagine euh, deux, deux récents euh, projets qui, qui s'inscrivent en plein dans, et qui rejoignent d'ailleurs un petit peu le projet Divergente. Euh, en 2020, en fait, en, en pleine crise Covid, on avait euh, la volonté de, de réformer notre, euh, notre média déjà depuis euh, quelques temps. Et on s'est dit, euh, pour, euh, pour entreprendre cette réforme éditoriale, on ne va pas le faire euh, dans notre petite tour d'ivoire, euh, l'équipe euh, de six personnes, dont quatre journalistes. On va essayer d'associer le public à la réflexion éditoriale qu'on veut mener, tout en ayant en tête euh, exactement depuis 25 ans les grandes lignes euh, et de ce qu'on voulait faire. Et donc on a imaginé un processus s'appelait Imagine 2020, où on a euh, à la fois euh, euh, lancé un questionnaire au lecteur, euh, à la fois on a fait des workshops euh, autour de thématiques, on a euh, surtout aussi créé le groupe qu'on appelle les pisteurs d'Imagine, qui sont 15 personnalités qu'on est allé chercher dans la société civile, euh, qui sont coprésidées par euh, Olivier de Scutter, que vous connaissez peut-être, qui est le professeur de droit et et rapporteur de l'ONU euh, sur les questions de pauvreté, mais aussi Fatima Zibou, qui est politologue. Il y avait des enseignants, des artistes, euh, des syndicalistes, euh, des gens, des ONG. Et donc ce petit groupe, les pisteurs d'Imagine, nous ont aidés à, à construire un peu le nouveau projet éditorial et le nouveau chemin de fer, euh, comme, on, comme on dit dans, dans le journalisme. Euh, à partir de là, on a aussi... Euh, écrit, coécrit euh, ce qu'on appelle le manifeste euh, de notre magazine, qui vient compléter la charte éditoriale euh, fondatrice, qui est donc un texte euh, très important, puisque c'est le manifeste de notre média qui, qui dit au public, euh, voilà le contrat euh, éditorial, intellectuel, que l'on veut passer avec vous, euh, voilà le point de vue que l'on défend, et notre, nos valeurs, ce sont celles-là. Euh, parce que je pense que, dans, on en parlera après, dans la crise des médias en général, parfois, il euh, y a aussi le fait qu'on peut reprocher aux médias de ne pas toujours, on ne sait pas toujours à partir de quel point de vue ils parlent, quelle est leur, euh, quelle est leur, leur ligne éditoriale claire. Euh, et donc, pour nous, c'était vraiment important, euh, en termes d'interaction avec le public, de dire, ben voilà, euh, la charte, le manifeste d'Imagine, c'est cela. Donc voilà, tout ce processus a débouché sur un nouveau, un, un nouveau contenu, une nouvelle maquette, un nouveau site internet éco-responsable. Enfin, il y a eu toute une réflexion aussi sur notre éco-responsabilité, puisqu'on voulait être à la fois cohérent entre nos paroles et nos actes, comme on dit. Donc ça, c'est un, un exemple de, entre guillemets, journalisme collaboratif qu'on a, qu a essayé d'insuffler, euh, se disant qu'on euh, n'est on pas euh, au-dessus de la mêlée et que parfois, il faut aussi aller chercher dans la société en permanence euh, euh, des idées, euh, des innovations euh, et ça s'inscrit aussi et ça rejoint le, le, le débat pré précédent sur le journalisme constructif euh, qui est un, un thème qui nous aussi nous tient à cœur euh, parce que euh, comme le disait un des interlocuteurs ce pas, on ne peut pas regarder le monde uniquement en se disant tout va mal, il y a aussi des choses qui vont bien et il faut aussi le, le dire deuxième exemple qu'on a mené avec Imagine c'était en, en plein Covid à nouveau en 2021 euh, à l'époque, il y avait une, beaucoup de... Enfin, toute la période qu'on a connue, notamment de confinement, et on se rendait compte que la jeunesse était euh, particulièrement euh, euh, dans le désarroi, euh, très isolée, en manque de... 
aussi de, de, d'expression. Et donc, on a imaginé un numéro spécial euh, de façon collaborative avec un, un panel de jeunes euh, qu'on est allé chercher à la fois euh, des jeunes qui venaient euh, d'horizons très, très différents, de la musique, euh, du monde des ONG, des activistes, euh, euh, etc. Et on a, on, on a fait une réunion de rédaction commune avec la rédaction d'Imagine et ce, cette rédaction euh, euh, temporaire de jeunes. Euh, on l'a dû faire en visio parce que tout était à distance. Et puis on a, avec eux, dit, bah voilà, si vous étiez rédacteur en chef d'Imagine pour ce numéro aussi, de quoi est-ce que vous auriez envie de parler alors les uns sont arrivés sur la crise climatique, les autres sur la, euh, les, les mouvements sociaux, euh, d'autres sur euh, euh, des, tas, des tas de questions. Et alors ensemble, ben, on a construit le, le numéro spécial et on les a associés jusqu'au bout en leur donnant carte blanche pour écrire chacun un texte. On a aussi lancé un concours dans les écoles de, de journalisme et de photo, enfin, etc. Donc c'était une manière d'associer, euh, de faire collaborer les publics euh, à, à notre projet. Voilà, et donc euh, de façon euh, générale... Ben, Très récemment, un troisième exemple aussi euh, qui me semble être assez proche et éloigné du sujet, mais qui est quand même là. Vous avez peut-être entendu parler, ça devait faire l'objet d'un autre débat ici, mais sur euh, cette charte euh, qui a été lancée par nos consoeurs confrères français, qui est la charte pour un journalisme à la hauteur de l'urgence climatique. Donc c'est une charte qui euh, euh, essaye de, de pousser les rédactions, les, les journalistes à titre individuel, mais aussi les, 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 les rédactions, à euh, s'engager plus fermement euh, sur ces questions-là, et à, à se réunir autour de 15, de 15 grands engagements euh, qui touchent à la fois euh, à la manière de parler des crises, des crises environnementales, mais aussi euh, à la fois euh, de l'usage des mots, la, la question des photos qui sont utilisées pour parler du climat, etc. etc. Donc euh, ça aussi, c'est, un, c'est parti d'une, d'une réflexion sur... Euh, ben, Qu'est-ce qui peut-être va nous, nous, nous réconcilier aussi avec les publics euh, Parce qu'on sait qu'aujourd'hui, il y a de plus en plus de citoyens qui sont fatigués par euh, cette overdose d'informations, cette euh, infobésité, comme on l'appelle, et qui sont, euh, euh, qui sont soit dans la tentation de se dire euh, « je me replie complètement, je ne veux plus entendre parler des nouvelles du monde, c'est trop sombre, trop anxiogène, trop insécurisant, etc. Euh, » Ou au contraire, qui sont... Euh, complètement frénétique et, 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 et addict euh, du fil de l'info. Et donc, euh, notre mission aussi, c'est, je crois, modestement, de, euh, d'apporter aussi un autre éclairage et de, de réconcilier, entre guillemets, ces citoyens euh, avec notre, notre métier du journalisme. Et je conclurai juste sur un, un livre et un documentaire qui a été réalisé par notre consoeur euh, Anne-Sophie Novel, qui s'appelait « Les médias, le monde et moi », que je vous invite d'ailleurs à, à, à regarder et à lire, et Anne-Sophie qui a beaucoup travaillé là-dessus euh, sur comment euh, euh, finalement combler le fossé entre la presse au sens large euh, et les citoyens au sens large, elle, elle préconise toute une série de choses euh, qui va de refaire notre métier de façon la plus rigoureuse possible, la plus précise, de continuer à enquêter, de continuer à dénoncer, mais aussi de continuer à inspirer, etc. Et elle, elle propose toute une série de choses. Et elle disait il faut qu'on recrée des nouveaux... Euh, des, des nouveaux contrats, une, des nouvelles formes de médiation avec les citoyens. Et tout à l'heure, Tamour en parlait, donc c'est, c'est la question de la relation entre, euh, entre les citoyens et les lecteurs, les spectateurs, etc. Donc euh, voilà. Donc ça, c'était euh, ma petite contribution euh, à la réflexion. Euh, je propose peut-être de relancer deux, trois questions à nos invités, euh, et puis de vous donner la parole après aussi, parce qu'on ne peut pas parler de journalisme participatif, sans faire participer le public, ce serait euh, particulièrement... Euh, euh, je, pro- je propose peut-être de re- regrouper les questions, si vous en avez. Euh, mais j'ai peut-être d'abord une première question à nos deux confrères consoeurs. Sophia, euh, euh, vous parliez de votre média, de la question d'être euh, en contact régulier avec vos lecteurs. Euh, est-ce que... Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, parce qu'il y a une certaine vision du journalisme qui dit euh, il faudrait que les citoyens puissent eux-mêmes être journalistes. Euh, vous, vous défendez autre chose, c'est de dire que les journalistes sont, doivent être des, le journalisme doit être fait par des professionnels, euh, avant tout, non Oui, je pense que there a une éthique an ethic conduct to be journalist and just journalists or people who practices in a professional way can guarantee you that the that we can that our information is trustworthy 
So I believe that even we, if we can, we can listen to people, of course, and we can investigate uh, suggestions that sources uh, uh, give to us, but we need to, to, um, to be sure that the information we publish is uh, bulletproof. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, we are not so different from the social media. <laughs> Euh, Peut-être, euh, 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 Aitor, pardon, est-ce que l'information qui vient des citoyens que vous allez chercher, euh, elle est souvent, parce qu'on a l'impression parfois que euh, les journalistes sont un peu en surplomb, sont parfois euh, euh, au-dessus de la mêlée, or on, a, on aurait tout intérêt à aller écouter davantage les citoyens, c'est ce que vous faites avec Politico Yeah, and I, I would say that it, I have the exact same opinion as, as Sophia in this... Uh I think the key thing is precisely that, that we are held to a higher standard. We're not just someone uh, going on social media and saying, you know, I, I hate the design of this street. Our job is to explain why the design of that street is so bad. Uh, so, you know, first of all, there's the technical side that Sophia was touching on, which is every story that I file for Politico, not only do I spend all the time that I need to spend researching it, interviewing the sources, writing it, editing it down, but then it goes through two layers of editors. So it goes directly to my direct editor, Esther King, and then after that it goes to James Randerson, who's our innovation editor, and then it goes to the production team before it even reaches any reader. So you're talking about several levels of people who are going through and making sure not only that everything is spelled correctly, but also raising their own questions and saying, did you really speak to everyone who can possibly give you a counter opinion on this? Are we making sure that this isn't excessively biased in one direction or the other? Which obviously for the common citizen who, with all of their good intentions, may be reporting on an issue, they're not obliged to go through all of those steps. And I think that does really, really help. I also think that because we have a, a uh, you know an obligation to be neutral, as much as we can personally sympathize with an issue, that ultimately makes our coverage of a topic much more valuable to the reader and to the citizen at large because they know that from us, in principle, they're getting uh, information that is not only vetted but that is coming from, again, an objective perspective and not just one of someone who's personally invested in that issue. We can separately be personally invested in that issue, but we have to focus on the journalistic ethics of it first. Euh, Tarmou, vous avez utilisé un, 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 un mot important qui est la confiance. Euh, on sait que la démocratie euh, est aujourd'hui parfois menacée par euh, les réseaux sociaux, les GAFAM, euh, ce débat, euh, parfois euh, des débats de plus en plus binaires, hein, c'est tout noir ou tout blanc, il euh, y a moins en moins de place pour la nuance, parfois. Euh, et, et la question de la, de la confiance en tant que médiateur, ombudsman, euh, entre les publics et les journalistes professionnels qui font un travail d'intérêt général, c'est important de retravailler sur ça Well, I think it's a key thing, because if, if people do not trust the media, then journalism really does not have a sense. Then uh, this is like a hobby for ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. A nice hobby, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it has a much higher value. <laughs> And that's why I think uh, relentlessly we should be working all the time of thinking how to be connected with our audiences. Um, and uh, uh, one uh, factor to be taken into account is that people can trust journalism if they can feel themselves in this journalism, if, they, if their views are echoed, if their concerns are being uh, tackled. Um, and for instance, just one small example, Uh, regarding the uh, role of the ombudsman in the public media company in Estonia. I'm doing a regular survey of uh, regional representation because, you know, all the underrepresented groups uh, are not very vocal. Some are very vocal, but not all. Some uh, groups of people who are underrepresented in the media, they don't know this. No one has told them that they are underrepresented. So I do regional representation thing because as the urban 
specialist, the journalist knows, uh, capital cities tend to be extremely important in a country. The case also in Estonia. The capital city, Tallinn, dominates everything. Sometimes people write to me or, or call me and say, OK, Tallinn radio, Tallinn television again, yes? Because, you know, all the news uh, items are uh, related to the capital city. So I'm doing this regional thing, and then I talk to the editors. Of course, it's up to the editor-in-chief to take care that all regions are represented. But again, there are many other stories. There's the war in Ukraine and the pandemic and so on. So it's up to the ombudsman to, to come from a side and to, to analyze things in a calm way. And then we can be much more connected. Um, in a previous panel, someone said, uh, was mentioning uh, the news avoiders. And people can avoid the news for many different reasons. But I'm afraid that actually there is a chunk of um, people who avoid the news, uh, who avoid mainstream quality news, um, is, is this group that we have lost altogether. And there is no point in trying to win them over. Why? Because if we try to win over the corona skeptics, uh, anti-vaxxers, for example, um, or some, some uh, uh, very anti-immigrant people, their terms for our work are unacceptable. We cannot discard our values. We can't have, you know, 50-50 like anti-immigration, pro-immigration people. We can't have 50-50 so-called false balance of anti-vaxxers and pro-vaccine pro people and so on. We have lost, actually, some of the people to the, uh, and they really hardline believers in alternative media. We've lost them. But of course, we should be taking care all the time that this group is not becoming too big. Otherwise, we will be practicing a hobby, a nice hobby of journalism. But uh, we don't want, we want to, journalism to be in the public interest. Mm -hmm. Sophia, I, I just want to say one thing, and because we are in, uh, you uh, will all be journalists in the future, so I think it's really important um, to make the question uh, about, uh, is the work we do really different from what we can read in the wall of our social media? Because that question, uh, it's, it's a key question, because I think journalists have also uh, our responsibility about media bashing. People don't trust in what we do because sometimes we don't do a good job. Uh, and our name and the name of our institution is our brand. And if we don't protect it, uh, we lose everything. So it's really, really important to uh, take care uh, about, uh, what, uh, about the information we publish. And we publish information. We, for God's sake, we don't produce content. Media, social media produces cont uh, content. We do information. It's, it's uh, quite different. Je, je me demandais, Sophia, avec Divergente, est-ce que vous êtes euh, attentif euh, et soucieux d'aller voir les publics que, qui n'ont euh, pas accès aux médias euh, très souvent, des publics parfois... Euh, euh, plus populaires ou des publics euh, euh, qui sont... Parce qu'on reproche aussi à la presse d'être euh, souvent le reflet euh, d'une certaine élite euh, des pouvoirs, euh, de lobby, euh, etc. Or, la rupture entre la presse et euh, les citoyens ne vient-elle pas aussi de ces publics on, dont on parle pas assez euh, Vous parlez des migrations, des gens les plus pauvres, euh, des, euh, et, etc. Quoi. I would say that our public is people who like to read and people who like to dig deeper uh, uh, on subjects because, as I, as I was saying, we do long-form journalism, big features. So, But what we try with the public conversations I was talking about is to reach another type of people, people who can, who can be my grandmother, Someone that is just interesting about that subject, but don't want to take uh, five hours reading uh, a big feature. So it's also about a physical contact. Take um, uh, reduce the distance between journalists and the public, and the public can be literate people uh, or just someone who is interested uh, on it and doesn't like to read. And I think we should. Uh, do efforts to reach uh, different uh, communities. 
Aitor, vous partagez ce yeah, point de vue Oui, complètement. Pour nous, comme je l'ai déjà mentionné avant, la Politico, la première audience a toujours été la you know, Brussels Bubble. So for us, one of the one of the most interesting things in uh, putting together this section is we are routinely interviewing people who do not read Politico. Uh, most of the people who we interview for our stories maybe know it exists, but definitely don't read it uh, because they're you know they don't they don't go to, to to find local affairs there. So in a lot of ways, it's interesting because by interviewing them and by putting these uh, spotlights on different cities around the EU. We are creating the incentive for these cities to talk about us because they see themselves reflected and so they take an interest. But also what we've ended up doing is uh, focusing on bringing to light issues uh, that are happening on the ground across Europe to very important people who live here and who do read Politico because they want to know what's going on in the council, but in the process also discover that you know uh, there is a huge issue, for example, for people with disabilities living in Parma or that there is a, you know, that there are people dying in Madrid because of heat stroke. Uh, so the idea is that in a lot of ways we're bringing this local information to people in power who might actually be able to do something about it already at the EU level and certainly shedding a spotlight and shedding a bit of, of uh, continent-wide attention on issues that can easily be swept out under the rug. Uh, I used to live in, in Portugal. I was a, a correspondent there for several years. And it was really interesting to be a foreign correspondent there because a lot of the local issues uh, that I would report on would become a much bigger issue the moment that they came out in the Spanish press. The Portuguese government would ignore it until suddenly it was published in El Mundo and then they would get very nervous that the Spaniards were talking about them and that they might look bad and then they would react and then they would do something about it. So in a lot of ways, by bringing these local issues to the international perspective to the international media, you can actually get movement on it very quickly. So just to loop back to that example I was giving you guys about Parma, Parma has a gay pride parade every year and they have it on a hill so basically no one with a disability can attend. And we wrote a story about it, about how this was very unfair because this was one of the biggest events in the city and yet it was cutting out a portion of the population. Within two hours of publishing that story, we got a call from the Parma City Hall saying that they were going to change the entire layout of the parade to make sure that people with disabilities could attend. But this was something that had been reported on in Parma for years and the government had done nothing. The moment it came out in Politico, they got very nervous. So part of our work is that level of, of focusing the spotlight, giving people an opportunity to speak. And if, if our audience happens to be a slightly more powerful audience, that can always be used to do a bit more constructive journalism in that sense. And, and that's something that we're very much in favor of. Thank you. Euh, on va peut-être euh, passer aux questions dans la salle, donc euh, on va les prendre, euh, j'en prie même, il y en a une là, ok. Madame, un micro là je pense, oui. Ok, uh, thank you very much, uh, I appreciate um, the, the, all the panel. Um, especially the four of you. It's uh, very, very uh, excited for me to be in this uh, conference. Uh, my name is Carolina Alvarez and I come from Mexico. And that's why it's uh, interesting for me to be here um, because um, first of all, for Mr. Tarmo uh, Tarmark, um, and Sofia de Palma and Mr. Aitor Hernandez. Um, for my background and your background, um, Mr. Tamberg is uh, mentioning that Estonia has also uh, trust uh, journalism. Uh, Mrs. Uh, de Palma is talking also about very important uh, situations about information to give uh, trust information around the world. And at the end, uh, Mr. Eitor Hernandez is talking about uh, political uh, global um, education and I, look at, I, I would like to focus my question 
because of the 18 um, journalists died working in Mexico in the field in 2022. And I hear that everyone is talking about the Middle East, about uh, the things happening in Europe, in Ukraine, but few people are watching the things happening in Latin America, especially from um, Mexico to Colombia and Venezuela, maybe also in Brazil. Uh, the things happening with a not trust collaborative journalism in these countries. Nicaragua, for example, uh, El Salvador, uh, Mexico itself, and we all share the common situation uh, being, as Biden said one time, not the uh, back garden of the United States, but the front garden. Uh, garden sorry. So this put uh, these countries in a very difficult situation to um, the governments being trustful to people. And journalists are very important in this um, job to, as Mrs. Sofia de Palma uh, mentioned before, the uh, journalists work as a Excuse me. information. The, what's your, your question? Go and my question goes directly to the three of you. How can you uh, involve the Mexican journalism to be trustful and not to be killed, you know, mm. not uh, the, because it's because the government <laughs> and the narco states, nar narco dealers and the narco state okay. killing the journalists and it's not safe to work as a journalist in these countries. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Uh. I don't know. I can, I, that's a very difficult question, actually, because of everything you said. Um, I don't know a lot uh, about Mexico, and I don't know a lot about what happened with uh, with Me Mexican uh, journalists. Uh, journalists. Journalists are always quite bad reporting about their own is issues, so uh, that's an important point also. But yes, it's a suggestion. Uh, we the thing is we have like the proximity value, and uh, we, in Portugal at least we report about Brazil because we share the the same language. Like Brazil uh, politics uh, is always in our daily news. That value uh, also have an impact of what we are reporting. But yes, I completely agree with you. <laughs> Well, I think international pressure is, is very important and the uh, coverage, uh, mm -hmm. a wide coverage of, uh, of various conflicts uh, regarding conflicts uh, with journalists uh, is important uh, uh, to have uh, uh, this topic up on the agenda at various international forums and places and this would be helpful. Uh, this is something actually which uh, Eitor has already spoken about, uh, how how things, uh, so-called little things can be changed by international uh, media attention. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, I think that ultimately this is a problem that obviously can only be resolved within Mexico and it requires political commitment at the national level and then at the regional level to clean up government and to ensure that people who kill journalists don't go free. Beyond that, you're absolutely right, the international community's uh, responsibility there is clear. Everyone has to, has to pressure there. And I think it's always important to reinforce that when, you know, um, obviously any, any sort of death is, is unacceptable. But especially when you're killing a journalist, it's not just that you're killing a person, it's that you're killing the access to information. Uh, and that's a, a key part of just having a functional civic society. If people can't find out what's going on, it's virtually impossible for you to have a functional democracy. Thank you. D'autres questions? Il y avait voilà, mademoiselle là-bas et puis aussi, oui. Bonjour. Bonjour. Euh, déjà, un grand merci pour traiter ce, ce thème de la confiance des publics, qui, à mon avis, est crucial parce que si on fait du journalisme et de l'information, bah, c'est avant tout pour les publics. 
pour les citoyens. Et on a une, une crise qui est terrible de ce côté-là. Il faut quand même euh, réaliser qu'il y a un grand nombre de la population euh, française, en l'occurrence je parle parce que moi je viens en France, euh, qui a complètement décroché des médias, euh, qui est dans une défiance absolue et euh, qui malheureusement euh, n'est pas du tout familière euh, de l'écrit, de la newsletter, etc. Et qui utilise pour principale source d'information euh, euh, les réseaux sociaux, notamment Facebook, pour ne euh, pas le citer, parce que Twitter, pareil, hein, ce n'est pas utilisé par tout le monde. Euh, moi, en fait, euh, je voudrais euh, vous poser une, une question sur euh, la localité, en fait. Parce qu'on parle beaucoup d'international, de, de sujets euh, qui vont concerner tous les pays, les migrations, etc. Mais euh, on méprise un petit peu le, le journalisme local. Et euh, je pense que c'est hyper important. Là, cette année, j'ai travaillé euh, sur un territoire très isolé, euh, euh, avec, euh, en faisant de l'éducation à l'information média, avec des populations qui sont mais, euh, complètement déconnectées de tout ça. Et elles s'en fichent royalement de la question des migrants ou, ou du Mexique. Ou voilà. Eux, ce qui les intéresse, c'est ce qui se passe chez eux. Et ils ne, laissent, ils ne lisent même pas la presse locale. Parce que même les journalistes locaux, au final pour des raisons économiques, etc., avec les, les titres de presse pour lesquels ils travaillent, ont même pu, euh, ne font même plus en fait, le travail du journalisme vraiment local. Et ces gens, euh, ils sont, mais en fait, par, par mignons euh, en France, et, euh, et on, on les a complètement perdus. Et, et moi, ça me fait peur, parce que ces gens, au final, ils votent, ils consomment, ils partagent des contenus euh, sur les réseaux sociaux. Et donc, je voulais voilà, vous demander euh, que, si on devait... Euh, euh, reprendre votre thématique de la confiance des publics, est-ce que ça passe pas déjà par l'engagement au niveau local des journalistes de réinvestir le terrain, d'être au contact euh, des, des habitants et, et des populations Um, I studied in Spain, and there, ironically, every national newspaper that I worked at was always on the verge of collapse, uh, and you were always in red numbers, and you didn't know if you were going to be fired from one day to the next, but regional media is doing really well, uh, because people still trust regional media and still consume regional media to find out what's going on. It's hyper-local. It involves covering a lot of farming conventions and things like that, so it's not exactly the sexiest market for uh, someone who's coming out of journalism school. But it's incredibly important journalism and ultimately creating um, confidence and creating that relationship of trust between the reader and the publication, I think is a lot more doable at that level when you can actually speak to the people. Um, Portugal is a super interesting example. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, Tarmo was mentioning it before and it's absolutely true. Portugal is a very good example of a country where everything is about Lisbon all the time. Maybe you'll get a couple of stories about Porto, but generally it's Lisbon, Lisbon, Lisbon. And a few years ago, I did a, a cycling trip from Lisbon to Santiago, and I passed through the interior. And in the interior, all the newspapers that I read in Lisbon, no one was reading. No one had the, the, the least interest in Diario de Noticias, in Espresso, et cetera. They were all reading Correo de Mañana, which is a tabloid newspaper, which is famous for you know its scandalous stories, but the big difference... And, and laudable difference that it has with the national ones is it's kept its network of regional correspondents. So even though most of the stories are ridiculous crime stories in terms of like, oh, somebody killed the priest and was found in bed with a goat, there's someone in that village writing that story and people, they want to see themselves reflected in the press. Uh, so I think, yes, the, the, the local media is super, super important and it's super important to create what we were talking about before with Mexico an enfranchised population, a population that actually takes an interest in what's going on and not just what they're reading on social media, which, as we all know, can easily be distorted. Pour compléter juste, je vous rejoins sur, sur l'importance de la presse régionale, la presse locale, qui est, et vous avez raison, parfois il y a dans la profession comme ça un peu de dédain et par rapport à cette, cette presse, parce qu'elle serait presse de proximité, presse de quartier, etc. Or, c'est la pour des futurs étudiants en journalisme, c'est une excellente école, euh, l'école du journalisme euh, local. Et par ailleurs, euh, un, vous avez raison, c'est des endroits où euh, on peut renouer avec les publics, euh, mais ça dépend, alors ça touche, c'est un grand débat, mais qui touche à la fois euh, au langage que l'on emploie, euh, parfois pour certains publics euh, précarisés, est-ce qu'on est suffisamment à la portée euh, le, le, le type d'information que l'on produit, etc. Mais ça renvoie aussi 
euh, au temps passé, euh, au plus près de la réalité, au plus près du réel. Et ça, ça renvoie aussi à, aux conditions sociales des journalistes de façon générale, à mon avis, euh, qui est euh, pour faire ce journalisme euh, plus proche, plus participatif, plus en phase avec la réalité sociale euh, et des vrais problèmes, entre guillemets, des vrais gens, euh, pour, comme une expression qu'on emploie parfois. Mais je crois qu'il faut qu'il y ait des journalistes qui soient euh, payés décemment, correctement, qui puissent passer du temps euh, euh, très régulièrement sur le terrain, euh, etc., etc. Et donc tout ça est très lié. Or, on sait que dans les rédactions, on a de plus en plus de journalistes euh, freelance, mal payés, euh, qui ont peu de temps, qui doivent écrire beaucoup pour, pour, pour vivre, etc. Donc les deux sont, sont aussi liés, à mon avis. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions Parce que oui, mademoiselle là-bas, on va peut-être vous passer le micro. On doit clôturer. Ah oui. Une dernière question Non, c'est vraiment en clôture. Non. Ah. Bon, ok. Désolé, vous pourrez la poser à nos invités en aparté alors. Ça va Voilà, on m'a dit aussi de vous dire que d'abord, merci. Thank you pour vos interventions. Merci au public.